If you're a visitor here, you probably figured out by now my name is Jim, uh, Jim Tanis. I'm one of the elders here. And if you're a visitor here, you may not know that right now we're without a pastor. We're looking for a pastor and have been for a bit of, bit of time. And so right now we're filling in with uh, some of the elders and some guest speakers and stuff like that. So you get me today, all right? The Bible, God's Word, was given us, given to us for a few reasons. It was given to us so that we could learn about God. Uh, it was also given to us so we could learn about ourselves, both the good and the bad. And it also was given to us so that we could learn how God would have us live. And so we've been going through uh, a passage of scripture uh, from the book of Romans. Uh, Romans was written to the Christian church in Rome in, in that region very early, almost 2,000, well, 2,000 years ago, basically. And written to the churches there and, and uh, has become part of our Bible because it teaches about God. So we're looking at Romans chapter 12. We've been looking at this for a while. And uh, it's funny that they had me on the schedule to speak this morning because we're going to talk about humility. Talk about being humble. Okay, and I'm really good at that, right? Yeah. So. Isn't hum humility, humbleness is a funny thing. Because if you say I'm humble, people go, oh, well, you're proud because you say you're humble, right? But people expect you to be humble. And... You know, it, it's just one of those confusing things. So we're going to work with that today. We're going to see what God's Word says about being humble. We're going to read this passage in Romans first uh, about love being sincere, or love in action, love being sincere. We're going to start just with praying, because I don't know about you. I need some prayer before I do this, and you're probably going to need some prayer too. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, I thank you that we have your Word the very words that, that you spoke, that you inspired, that your Holy Spirit gave us, so that we can learn about you. We can learn about ourselves. We can learn about what you would have us do, how would you would have us live our lives. Lord, I pray that as I speak this morning, that you give me the right words, that you would enable me to be clear and concise, and uh, that you would open up people's hearts to listen to what your Holy Spirit says through your word as well. Lord, we thank you again for who you are, for your love for us. In your name, amen. The first slide, which should be if we can go back to it, uh, says embracing humility, getting over yourselves. And this passage that we're going to look at in several passages in scripture talks to us a lot about how we should behave and part of it is saying get over yourself consider others first before you consider yourself so we're going to read this passage we're going to read um, a few verses in Romans 12 and then we're going to focus in on, on an, uh, a main verse love in action love must be sincere hate what is evil cling to what is good be devoted to one another in love Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Now that's what we looked at last week, that idea of rejoicing and mourning with people who rejoice and mourn, the idea of empathy and the idea of harmony, getting along with each other. That verse goes on to say, do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far it as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now we're going to go to that verse there, the second part of verse 16. Do not be proud, 
Uh, yeah, do not be proud. Be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. This is where the humility part comes in. Basically, that's verse is telling us to be humble. We're not very good at humble, are we? Do not be proud. Be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. We're going to look at some different translations of Scripture on that, if we can go to the next slide. We just read from the New International Version, and that's one that we leave here, uh, that we use here a lot. If we can go on to the next slide, please. Um, it says, do not be proud. Be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. But there's other versions of the Bible that are very accurate, just different translations into English. We're going to look at a couple of those. The next one is from the New English Translation. It says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not be conceited. What does haughty mean? It's funny, this is a New English Translation. We don't use that word very much in English now, haughty. But it's a good word. Because haughty means not just being proud. It means showing your pride. It means being a little bit arrogant. Haughty means, so oh, I don't associate with those people. And being vocal about it. So we can be proud quietly. We can be proud secretly. But haughtiness shows. It shows in our attitude. It shows in our words. It shows in our actions. So that's something to consider. It also talks about low position. In, in, that, in that one. Uh, but you know, low position or, or, uh, is, uh, what, oh, I've lost my place here, the lowly. That's about position. That's not about worth. And that's one of the things I want to stress through here. It's going to talk about uh, people of low position. It's going to talk about people being, uh, being lowly, people being humble has nothing to do with value, nothing to do with worth. It has to do with the position or area of responsibility that people are in. Same thing with status. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about status as far as that position, that responsibility. So we want to keep those words in mind. If we go on to the next slide, if we're going to the... Christian Standard Bible, another good translation. It says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. In other words, get over yourself, right? Moving on. And this is the Common English Bible. I really kind of like this one. It says, consider everyone as equal. Don't think that you're better than anyone else. Haughtiness, pride, self-pride, that's thinking you're better than other people. And God's word says, don't think you're better than anyone else. It says, instead, associate with people who have no status, who have no position. Those lowly people or those people of low position. It says, don't think you're so smart. The first version we looked at said, don't be conceited. Don't think you're so smart. That's what we want to talk about. Now, I'm not up here to preach at you about this. I'm up here to, to talk to all of us about this. Because if I was going to say, you people need to listen to this, and I would be being proud, I would be being haughty, and I wouldn't be humble. And so I'm going to try to avoid that. So we're going to go on here. Again, pride, status, low position, that all speaks of function and procedure. Areas of responsibility has nothing to do with personal worth. Nothing to do with value. And God's word treats people with personal worth and value. God treats people with personal worth and value. So that's one thing we want to consider today. What did Jesus say about judging others? If we look at the, the next slide, Jesus said, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you'll be forgiven. 
Give and it will be given to you, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured in your lap. For with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. So God's not just talking about finances or things. He's talking about how we treat people. We treat people in that giving manner. People will treat us in a giving manner. And for the measure that we use, it will be measured to you. It's kind of a, a, a kind way of saying we get what we, we get what we give. Kind of you get what you deserve. If we could go to the next slide. Because Jesus also told them in a parable, he said, can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall in a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. And he says a really interesting thing. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank or the board that's in your own eye? I work in a cabinet shop. I'm a cabinet maker. I know all about sawdust in your eye. You get a speck of sawdust in your eye, you can't see anything. Your eye's watering, it hurts, you know, whatever. And all you want to do is get that out of, out of your eye. Jesus is saying, when you've got that situation, why are you worried about the sawdust in someone else's eye? Are you in any position to judge someone else? Am I in any position to judge someone else? If I've got a chunk of wood in my eye, and they have a little speck of sawdust in theirs, I should be worried about the one in the plank in my eye, right? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when you fail to see the plank in your own eye? And then Jesus is hard on us sometimes. He says, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye. Then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Huh. That's wisdom. Why are we judging others? Why are we looking down on each other? Why are we being proud about our situation and not taking in consideration another person's situation? Jesus speaks very strongly against that. Anything that Jesus tells us we need to pay attention to, anything that he tells us strongly we really need to pay attention to. So how does this work out in our life? You know, how does, I mean, how does this work out? If we're considering people of low position, associating people of low status, and again, that's not value. That's just their position, their area of responsibility, where they're at in life. How do we do that? Well, we consider one another above ourselves. I'm going to look at another thing. Jesus gave the disciples an example in John. And we've looked at this, but I don't know if we've ever looked at this in this perspective. Jesus and the disciples were meeting. Okay. And in that culture, this was the Middle East 2,000 years ago. No sidewalks, no paved roads, uh, no Adidas runners. Okay, people were walking around in sandals or they were walking barefoot. So a dusty road in sandals, your feet get dirty, right? So when someone came to your house, then you would make provision for that. They'd come over for dinner for your house, they've dressed up, they've put their best clothes on, they've had a shower or a bath or whatever, but by the time they get to your place, their feet are dirty. Okay, so if you're a little well off and you have somebody in the house working for you, you would have your servant help them wash their feet when they come in the door. Okay, there would be a basin there. There would be someone to help them with that. If you weren't very well off, you may even help them wash their feet themselves. Jesus, used a, he, 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 he did something here that was really cool, and I think we need to look at that. It said, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he knew his status. He knew his position. All right? He said, so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, his outer robe or whatever, wrapped a towel around his waist, 
After that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. So this is Jesus. This is their leader. This is their master. This is the prophet. This is the one who came from God. And he gets up from the table. He realizes nobody's washed the disciples' feet. And he makes sure that their feet gets washed. He doesn't tell somebody to do it. He doesn't go to find a servant. He takes off his jacket, whatever, grabs a towel. He washes their feet. All right? When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his outer clothes and returned to his place. Then he asked them a question. Do you understand what I have done for you? He said. He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. But now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. So when we look back at our verse in Romans, where it says, don't think that you're better than anyone else. Instead, associate with people who have no status. Don't think you're so smart. Or when we look at the other version that says, don't be haughty. Don't be conceited. The one that says, don't be proud. Associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. What is Jesus telling these people here? Do you understand what I've done for you? Well, he's given them an example. And we're going to go on to find out what, what he expects them to do with that example. But he goes on to say, he says, I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And he reminds them of his status. He reminds them of who he is. He says, I'm your teacher. You know, I'm your Lord. Now that carried a lot of weight. This is a guy everybody looked up to. They should have been washing his feet. And here he is washing their feet. They were his disciples, his followers. And yet he was performing this menial task for them. And he said, you should do the same for each other. This is the example I've set for you. He goes on to say, Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Wow, no servant is greater than his master. But the master just behaved as a servant. That's the example that Jesus gave. So what is he expecting from us? We can go to the next slide. No master is greater than his servant, or no servant is greater than his master. So why did Jesus wash the disciples' feet? We don't usually do the question and answer thing, but why do you guys think he washed the disciples' feet? Any input? No, nope. shaking heads. Somebody's grinning. So what's this? To be an example. To be an example of what? Being humble. Being a servant. When we're told that we're supposed to be humble, not be conceited, that we're supposed to serve one another in love, this is what Jesus means. He means that there's no positional difference between us. We may have different roles. We may have different things to do. But we're supposed to be treating each other equally. We're supposed to be serving each other and loving one another. Jesus the Master led by example, by denying himself, by denying his status, his position, by serving others in humility. Now Jesus didn't say that he wasn't their Lord and Master. But by his actions, he said, I'm going to act on your level. I'm going to serve you. In fact, I'm going to put myself in a position 
a function and a position where I'm beneath you to serve you. That's humility. That's being humble. We're really good at that, aren't we? <laughs> I'm not. Okay, now you're saying, oh, Jim, you're just being falsely humble. <laughs> you know, because we do that with humble, right? We are not very good at being humble. We get our backs up. We don't... <laughs> We want to be treated well. We would much rather people would treat us in humility and do things for us than to just automatically do things for him. But Jesus said we need to follow his example. We need to embrace the whole idea of humility and serve each other. Jesus also said in another passage in Matthew, he said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. In John, he said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. Every, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus, to be a Christian? Well, a disciple is someone who, in following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission of Jesus. And Jesus just said it's someone who is willing to deny themselves put their own desires, their own concerns, their own wishes aside, take up their cross, and follow him. That's a tough one. We live in a world that says, you have the right to do this. You, we live in a world that says, be proud. We live in a world that says, if somebody's coming down on you and treating you the way, just walk away. You don't have to put up with that. That's our world. Our world says, stick up for yourself. Jesus isn't saying, be a doormat. Jesus is saying, have the bravery to deny yourself and serve others. No servant is greater than his master. A disciple is someone who, who is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and committed to the mission of Jesus. That's the taking up your cross. Followers of Jesus, we use the term Christian nowadays. Followers of Jesus were first called Christians in Antioch. What does Christian mean? Who can help me out? What does Christian mean? We use that all the time. It's got... It's got Jesus' name in it, Christ. Christian meant Christ ones, or Christ followers. That very idea of taking up your cross, denying yourself, and following me. That's what a Christian is. A friend of mine told me he, he hesitates to use the word Christian because it has a connotation, different kinds of connotation to different people. There's now some historic aspects of that that really aren't Christian. So if you say, I'm a Christian, some people may go, oh, well, gee, I don't really want anything to do with you. But what it initially meant, back here in Acts, was someone who followed Jesus. A Christian referred to anyone, man, woman, or child, who trusts in Jesus Christ as his or her Savior and Lord, denies themselves, and strives to follow him in every area of life. That's truly what a Christian is. So this friend of mine would say, I don't like to use the word Christian. I would like to say, I'm a follower of Jesus, which is very accurate. Very accurate. Jesus said, you know, come and follow me. Now, Christian is not a bad term to use, but sometimes it needs some explanation. Christians are followers of Jesus. They're anyone who trusts in Jesus as his or her Savior and Lord, denies themselves, and strives to follow him.
Jesus said, back to the previous slide, he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. But he also said, a new command I give to you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The first mark of a disciple is how we treat each other. And Jesus set that standard up. We talked about this last week. Jesus said, this is how people will know. If you show love one to another, that's us. That's us in the family, the people who call themselves Christians or followers of Christ. If we show love to each other, then the world can look at us. People outside that family can look at us and go, I think there's something real there. I think these people really are followers of Jesus. They really are disciples. They really are Christians. If we don't show love to each other and to the world around us, then the folks who aren't believers have every right to question whether we're believers. And I know some people have told me, no, Jim, that's not true. You know, people can't judge you. Well, Jesus says they can. Jesus says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, that implies if you don't love one another, they can question it. Right? That's a heavy burden to carry. Jesus helps us carry it. But we need to take that seriously. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Going back to the verse that we've been talking about, don't be proud, don't be conceited. Associate with people. Be humble. Get over yourself. Love one another. Embrace humility. If we're to be Christians, followers of Jesus, we need to follow him in humility. In Ephesians, Scripture says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. This is not a suggestion. This is not, well, it might be a good idea if you did this. This is, this is what you need to do. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now, I don't know about you. I'm pretty good at that. I can do that four or five times a day. No, I don't know about you. That's hard to do. It is very hard to be humble and gentle, to be patient, to bear with one another in love. It's very hard to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. I grew up in a family of two brothers and a sister, and we spent half our time punching each other in the head. And we, you know, and sometimes Christians act the same way. And my sister did too, actually, so don't let her off the hook. But sometimes Christians behave the same way. We're so busy fighting with each other. How in the world would anybody think that we actually love each other or that we're actually followers of Jesus? We're supposed to follow Jesus in humility, in loving one another. It's not an option, it's a command. And it's the trademark, it's the logo of a believer. By this will all men know that you are my disciples if you show love one to another. There's a, that's a big if. If we don't, they have a right to question it. Okay. Scripture goes on to say, and this is, this is where we're headed through this whole talk. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. 
Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Do not, uh, above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And this is the key. This is why we can do this. Jesus is our Lord and Master, right? The Bible tells us that Jesus is fully God and fully man. Jesus is part of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But it says here, in Philippians, it says, the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Jesus was God himself. He humbled himself. He didn't think being God was something to be used to his advantage in this situation. He made himself nothing and became by very nature a servant. Now scripture goes on to tell us that Jesus carried that to the ultimate degree by actually serving us, by dying for us to pay the penalty of our sin when we couldn't pay it ourselves. There's no way we could do that. The Bible tells us there's no one righteous, not one. The Bible also tells us that all our righteousness is like filthy rags. The best we can do doesn't measure up. So Jesus did it for us. That's way beyond washing someone's feet. That's way beyond. And Jesus himself was willing to do that for us. Now guess what folks? We're the people of low position. We're the humble in this situation. And Jesus associated with us more than that he actually loved us. And he acted in love for us by giving his life. That's humility. We, we read before that no servant is greater than his master. Jesus, the master, led by example, by denying himself, denying his status, denying his position, by serving others in humility. I want to go back to those, in closing, I want to go back to those few verses. Where it said, Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. That's not an option, it's not a suggestion. If you want to be his disciple, this is what we need to do. And he also said, a new command I give to you. Now this is God Almighty, this is the Master, this is our Lord commanding us. Again, not an option. A new command I give to you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And the kicker is, he says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's the mark of a believer. That's the mark of a Christian. That's the logo, if you will. People can look at your actions, that you love one another, and say, I think that person's a Christian. If we don't love one another, they have every right to say, I don't know. I don't think that person's a Christian. The onus is on us. Tough job. Jesus has promised that he'll help us do that. He'll enable us to do that. He doesn't just come alongside. He will help us do that. He gives us his Holy Spirit so that we can do that. By this will everyone know that you're my disciples if you love one another. This is not Jim Tannis preaching to you. This is Jim Tannis talking to himself and all of us. I struggle 
with loving. Man, there's some people I do not find lovable. And I'm sure you can all say that. There's some people I would just turn and walk the other way. Jesus said love them. You know, some people are easy to love, right? Jesus said love those too. But he said love the unlovable. And he said do that because I did it. As I have loved you, you must love one another. By this will everyone know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. We need to embrace humility. We need to embrace loving one another. We're going to pray. i ask the worship team to come up and continue to teach us that new song. All right? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you more than anything in this situation for your example that you, the creator of the universe, the one who put this all together, would serve us by loving us, would serve us by dying for us, would figuratively wash our feet, and would enable us to do that for others. Lord, it's just, uh, it's overwhelming. We can't fathom it, but we know we need to do it. So we thank you that you help us. In your name, amen.